Well, good morning, everyone. By the time this video is posted, our nation will be marking an historic election day. And to deepen our understanding of this political moment, I invited three members of our faculty to speak to us about the political and social factors shaping this election. We recorded this conversation ahead of election day, and it won't reflect specific results or events taking place today. The reflections of our faculty will provide context and insight into the issues we're confronting in this moment. So I'm joined by three professors from our Department of Government, Jonathan Ladd, an associate professor who also teaches in our McCourt School of Public Policy, Hans Knoll, associate professor and author of the book, Political Ideologies and Political Parties in America, and Jamil Scott, assistant professor in our Department of Government, whose research focuses on political behavior and representation, as well as race, ethnicity, and gender politics. So Jonathan, Hans, and Jamil, thank you for joining us today. Now, over the course of the past few weeks, the three of you led live conversations following the debates in September and October. Could you talk about the perspectives that each of you bring to these conversations and what you might have learned from one another having these conversations together? And perhaps I'll invite John and then Jamil and then Hans to respond. Well, thank you. Uh, first, thank you for the opportunity to be here and participate in this conversation. Uh, I'll start by saying, um, I think one of the nice things about the conversations uh, among the three of us is that we're friends because we teach in the government department and know each other. Um, and we are, have a somewhat similar perspective, uh, but also some key differences and key different areas of expertise that each and can we can each help each other, right? So, um, for instance, uh, we all know something about elections, and uh, we all know something about public opinion and voting and how that works. Um, uh, Jamil has some special expertise that that we don't have in particular candidate recruitment and particular, you know, who runs for office, um, among many among other things. Um, Hans has special uh, knowledge about. Um, especially party formation and how parties and ideologies have evolved over time, as well as the presidential nomination process uh, that uh, I don't have. And uh, I have studied a little bit more about um, uh, the news media and news media persuasion. Um, and so, you know, we understand each other as political scientists. We also have, you know, special expertise that we that can, that can uh, weigh in on particular issues. And that's why I've thought it's been a nice conversation. Thank you. Jamil? Yeah. Um, so thank you for the opportunity uh, to, to be here. Again, with John and Hans, I think at this point, we're almost a, a traveling show, I would say. <laughs> uh, but I think um, these opportunities to chat with them about what's going on has been really great. Because um, as, as John mentioned, we do, um, as and we all are we all are Americanists, but we do bring different things to the table. And I think um, uh, I think my perspective can be um, a bit unique in that um, talking about candidates, but also talking about the racial and gender dynamics um, that might come into play when we're talking about the election cycle. Um, and it's it's always great to be in conversation with John and Hans because I think. I learn something new every time. Uh, they always bring some historical fact, <laughs> I can say, um, that definitely uh, brings a highlight to the conversation. But I think for the most part, there are a number of things that we, we agree on and, um, uh, or they, they, they bring some new aspect that I haven't thought about. So it, it's always great to, to work with them. Thank you, thank you, Hans. So I, I also want to say thank you for the opportunity. This is a fun conversation, and I'm really uh, happy to, to be able to be part of it. Um, and I'm encouraging my uh, my undergraduate uh, large USPS class that they should all um, they should all watch it. Um, I mean, I don't think I can add anything more about like you know the specifics of our different expertise. John did a really great job of summarizing that. But um, I mean, one thing I'll just notice, like so, John and I have known each other for a really long time. In fact, since before either of us finished graduate school, before we were here at Georgetown. Um, and I always find it's useful to talk to John about um, ideas because while we have some similarities in perspective, 
um, you know, we're, we come things things slightly differently. And so I always get a lot. And I mean, my, my books and my other projects have always gained a lot from uh, from trying out ideas with with John. Um, and it's even more valuable, I think, um, to when we can talk to Jamil because perhaps counterintuitively to people, but um, the, the younger faculty, so assistant professors, people who are closer to having gotten their PhD, so they're usually smarter than the rest of us because they just have been, you know, they're, they're, the bar is always raised going up, but also because they're more closely to the literature, I mean, having spent time in, um, you know, in doing that in graduate school, whereas, um, you know, it's been uh, longer for John and I, so we can't keep up uh, as easily. Um, and so it's always been great to, to like talk to, to somebody who remembers and actually has, has read the stuff that I just heard about and can, can tell us um, what it's, uh, what's going on. So it's been that really useful. Um, conversation for that reason. Thank you. Thank you. Now, when you think about these convenings, what are the sorts of questions that you've received most frequently about this election? What, what context do you think the average voter or observer of this election could use to more deeply understand this political moment? And Jamil, maybe we could start with you and then Hans and John. You know, I think we, we definitely get a lot of questions um, about uh, what happens next or what um, what's going to happen with this election cycle? Can we be uh, sure about the polls? Uh, I think there is some concern about what's going to happen on election day or uh, what happens past election day because uh, I, I don't think we as political scientists can be even sure that uh, we'll be sure about the results of election day on election night. So um, I think around this election cycle, there is some anxiety given, uh, you know, current events. Um, there have been a number of just real events that have happened um, that uh, from the pandemic to protests um, and they're continuing to be real events in people's lives. So I think um, this election more than others because people are at home and um, really thinking about politics in a way that I don't think we've seen in a while. Um, people are concerned about um, election day and what happens next. Thank you. Thank you. Hans? Well, um, I mean, Jamil's right. We do get a lot of questions about uh, what's going to happen next and a lot of questions about whether or not we can trust the polls. Um, maybe maybe John can tell us his, his expertise about why it is we should be able to trust the polls. <laughs> um, one, um, what, but one thing that I think we often uh, lose sight of, because it's just such a weird election cycle, both because of the ways in which Trump is just unusual, but also because of the coronavirus and everything else, um, is that like in a, in a typical year, we would expect that the incumbent would be up at this point, right? Typically incumbents win re-election. Um, and, you know, before the coronavirus pandemic really hit uh, the United States, Trump was, you know, he was not super popular, but he was doing kind of okay. Um, and so the fact that he's not only not up, but he's trailing by big in the polls is, is something we should just notice and, and, and sort of take into consideration in terms of how things play out. Uh, that it's just it's an unusual situation. He should we'd expect him to be to be winning. Um, we'd expect him to be um, to have been more popular even before the economic downturn and the and the uh, pandemic hit. Um, those are probably the explanations for why he's not doing as well as you'd expect. Um, but. Uh, to ha sort of get the, the ways in which this election is different is to sort of you have to benchmark against um, expectations, which are we are we are far outside of, which means, of course, it's hard to know what to expect since we're so far outside of expectations. Thank you. John? Uh, yeah, so one question we get, uh, it, it, as uh, Jamil and Hans noted, is is about the polls and should we take it, should we take the polls seriously. So, so I'll give a take on that. Is I, th <laughs> um, I think, you know, the the polls don't necessarily tell you exactly what's going to happen. Uh, the polls had some problems in 2016 and got some things right in 2016. And so, since then, we we don't know if the polls are automatically right, but we have learned a little bit about how they're wrong and when they're wrong. We didn't know in 2016. So, what happened in 2016 was. Uh, the national polls were fairly accurate. And then the, the average of national polls in the week before the election had Hillary Clinton ahead by three points and her national margin was two points. That's as accurate as polls that ever get. I mean, they don't tend to get more accurate than that. Polls, there were some bad polls that were quite inaccurate in some states. 
Um, so the states that were surprising were surprising because the polls were wrong in um, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Wisconsin, Michigan mainly. Um, uh, Pennsylvania polls showed it to be a very close state. And so, um, and the American Association for Public Opinion Research did a report, uh, the, the National Scholarly Association of Pollsters did analysis and a big report about this. And I think their conclusions are correct that the polls that were wrong were either done poorly in general or specifically weren't weighting by education. The polls tend to get uh, too many people with college degrees and too few people without college degrees. Um, and that often isn't a problem, but it is a problem when P President Trump is running, uh, whose support uh, gets a lot of support from people without bachelor's degrees and much less support from people who do. He tends to also get some more support by, from people who don't trust government or trust other people, like what's called social trust or governmental trust. So if you have too many people in your polls who trust other people and trust the government and too many people with bachelor's degrees, your poll will probably be off unless you weight them, you weight down those people and weight up the few people you have who don't tr are less trusting and who don't have degrees. So if you wanna evaluate the, the type of poll to believe, make sure that they are weighting by education correctly. Um, and, and if they're not, if they don't talk about that, if you can't find that anywhere, I would, I would, be, I would be more skeptical. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, th this election is historic in several ways. One notable first is the fact that Kamala Harris is the first Black and South Asian woman to serve as a major party's vice presidential candidate. And Jamil, you've done terrific research into trends around women of color running for office, including an examination of the 2018 midterm elections. What trends are you seeing when it comes to black women and other women of color running for office? What are some of the political or social factors shaping candidates' experiences? And what does Senator Harris's position on the ticket mean for future candidates of color, particularly women of color? Yeah, so that, that's a really great question. Um, I think uh, from 2018, we saw uh, a greater number of women on running, right? And I, I think that's a, an important story to tell. But um, what we do know about Black women in particular, their numbers in office have been rising steadily, particularly when we think about state level politics. So they are running in state legislatures. But I think um, what looks different is where they're running. So um, where we see women of color, um, particularly black women being the most successful is in majority minority districts. Um, what makes folks like uh, Kamala Harris different is that she's had success um, in, uh, as, a, as a senator. So she's run uh, statewide and we often don't see women of color in statewide positions. Um, in 2018, we had Stacey Abrams running in Georgia to be the uh, governor, and we've never had a, a woman of color as governor in the country. Right? And so um, it's, it's a historic moment to think about Kamala Harris running as a vice president because we know that this has implications. Who, who is vice president have implications for who the party might tap next to be president? And so um, just like 2008 was a moment to, to think about uh, for um, the role model effect or representation um, for young people and uh, Black folks thinking about who's running for office, I think women of color might think about Kamala Harris in a, in a space of representation. She's certainly not everyone's favorite, but I think um, she can be a political role model for the heights to which um, women can, can uh, rise to run. Uh, and so I think it is certainly an important moment to think about uh, not just for uh, Black people, but also for Asian Americans, because uh, she is representational in, in that regard. And while um, Black people have a strong history of voting and association with the Democratic Party, Asian Americans are still are trending Democratic, but are not solidly Democratic. And we don't always see mobilization go into that group. And so I think that this is an important point for the group um, as a perhaps a, 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 a nod towards 
um, perhaps a nod towards representation and also perhaps a nod towards the party taking this group more seriously, um, just as we see more attention to Latino voters in the last couple of years. And I think what we'll continue to see, given that Latino voters are uh, also trending democratic, but not necessarily solid in the party. Thank you. Thank you very much. John, you, you recently contributed to a new book called Words That Matter, How the News and Social Media Shaped the 2016 Presidential Campaign, which explored the role of the media in that year's election and examined what kinds of information voters actually used to shape their decision. Could you describe some of your key insights and any differences that you're seeing this year? Sure. Um, the nice part about that was is one of these great Georgetown collaborations, I should say, that uh, Letitia Bodie, who's a associate professor in the Communication, Culture, and Technology program, also worked on writing that, and Lisa Singh in the Computer Science Department at Georgetown also worked on that, as well as some co-authors from the University of Michigan. So it's a great team. So what did we do? So in 2016, uh, one of the things we did was we partnered with Gallup uh, to run a poll that asked 500 people every day throughout the whole campaign. Um, what did you read, hear, or see about Donald Trump in the last few days? And let them just say whatever they wanted. And what did you read, hear, or see about Hillary Clinton in the last few days? And they could say whatever they wanted. And so with 500 people a day, every three-day window, you have 1,500 people. So every three-day window is a poll, <laughs> right, is, is, a, is a poll sample. And so what did we find? Well, we found that uh, in 2016, people were talking about uh, Hillary Clinton's email scandal pretty much throughout the whole campaign. Um, if you look for the word email, if you look for, uh, we ran a computer topic model, which picked with the, where the computer and the software finds topics. And you also find the email topic consistently. In contrast, um, Donald Trump, people kept hearing about different stories and then they would go away. Uh, so the typical story, uh, when, when a story would break and then we'd track it, um, it would mostly fade out of survey response five days later and def and almost entirely fade out 10 days later. So we had a series of stories, none of which really lasted very long about uh, Donald Trump. The other, the, the, the last, final thing I'll say about 2016 is in terms of the things people were said they were hearing about both candidates, most things were negative. Um, we ran what's called a, a, a sentiment evaluator that, that gives you a sense of the pot, whether the people, things that people are saying are positive or negative sentiment. And they were overwhelmingly negative. They were hearing negative things about Donald Trump and they were hearing negative things about Hillary Clinton throughout the whole campaign. And that reflects what polls find, which is that both the candidates were pretty personally unpopular in 2016. You have an election where both people were unpopular. So, What's happened? What's happening this year? So, um, Joe Biden, in contrast to Hillary Clinton, has fairly positive personal favorability ratings, um, uh, and we're hearing generally some about the middle to slightly positive sentiment in terms of what people say they're hearing about Joe Biden. Uh, people's evaluations, uh, personal evaluations of Donald Trump are fairly negative and have been fairly negative for a while, have really don't change much. Uh, uh, and, and so this time in contrast to 2016, um, things people say closed ended and open ended are more positive about um, the Democratic candidate than the Republican candidate and was not true. And the other big difference is that it was not true in 2016. The other big difference is that the, the equivalent story that people mention uh, all the time in these open ended and so we're running these open and asking these open-ended questions again, um, is coronavirus. I mean, not surprising for anybody, but um, consistently, people mention it over and over and over again. They're, consistently, people mention it over and over and over again, um, especially about uh, Donald Trump. Like, what do you hear about Donald Trump? Something about coronavirus. What did you hear about Donald Trump? Nothing about coronavirus. Over and over and over again. Um, and they say more about what they've heard about him than, than uh, what they hear about Biden. I will say they have, people do report hearing about Hunter Biden. They report, you see the word Hunter and you see the word son in terms of things people have heard about um, Joe, about Joe Biden. Uh, but the difference is it's not the dominant story throughout the whole campaign like email was. If, if there's anything comparable, it's coronavirus, which gets mentioned over and over this year. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hans, earlier this year, you taught a course on the presidential nominating system in the United States. And during the course, students traveled in February to witness caucuses in Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, and South Carolina firsthand. What did you and the students in that course witness during these trips? Well, well we saw a lot. Um, it, was, it was a fantastic class. I got to say, it's probably my the favorite class I've ever taught uh, here at Georgetown. Um, and I look forward to doing it again in, in four years. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that we had a great group of students. And so, you know, it's not hard to find a, a seminar worth of um, Georgetown students who are really interested in politics and really knowledgeable about it. And, and we were lucky to have them. Um, and a lot of them are now uh, over the summer and now working um, in on campaigns or in the media covering politics and so forth. And so they're going on to do great things. Um, as we went around the country, I mean, we got a chance to get really up close and, and personal with uh, with the election. We were in caucuses in uh, in Iowa and Nevada. We were, you know, in the you know in the caucuses on the Strip in Nevada, watching right right there where um, uh, where the people are making discussions and debating and arguing about what they would like to to do. Um, and we you know saw the Iowa caucuses unfold as everywhere else was having a hard time finding out what was going to happen there. We went to the debate in New, in New Hampshire and we were out, got seats really nice right up and close but near the stage actually. We got lucky with that. Um, and in every place we got to talk to voters at in rallies and, and talk to voters who were, who were about to vote and, and the like. And it was just it was a really a really valuable um, experience for all of those uh, all of those things. Um, one um, one thing that we I think sort of lesson that we got and the, the students really picked up on this is just how diverse voters assessments are of uh, these candidates. I mean, we tend to boil everything down and say there's a, you know, there's a liberal or conservative dimension or something. So the Democratic Party now is, is the, there's these lanes and there's a, there's a conservative lane or sorry, a, a liberal lane, a progressive lane, a um, more extreme lane, and then a more moderate lane. And like, that's how we should think about politics. Um, and I mean, there's some coherence to that, but what we found from talking to voters and also from hearing the campaigns and the way that they pitched themselves to voters was just how diverse that was. And we talked to a voter who was like their first choice was Bernie Sanders and their second choice was Joe Biden. Or we talked to a, you know, a, a Elizabeth Warren voter who was also really keen on, on Pete Buttigieg. And, and that like seeing how those, those, uh, those people make those decisions and how seriously the, everybody who's involved takes both their decision, right, the voters, but also the you know campaigns take this like we're doing this and we're trying to 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 get the you know get the right person chosen and and really you know participating in democracy, um, and it made I think a lot of the the students really felt like hey this is how how democracy um, you know talks about how it's supposed to work. Um, I'm a, I'm a co-author of a book on presidential nominations, um, the, the party decides, and we've been. Uh, looking at recent events since the book came out 12 years ago um, and how that might recast our argument. And so um, a lot of my thinking has been that way. And the, the students, it was great to share with them the fact that we're doing that and also get their feedback on how things are different. And that will help them, of course, shape uh, the next iteration of that book. Thank you. Thank you. Now, political engagement can take many forms and extends far beyond the act of voting. As we close, What's one thing you would like our community to consider about their political engagement after election day, no matter the results? And maybe Hans, I'll, I'll turn to you first and then John and then Jamil. Well, there's a, I mean, a lot of things that, you know, we'd, we'd hope that people would um, would think about with participation because as you point, there's so much more than, than just voting. Vote, there's so much more than just voting that one can do. Um, I think the thing I would try to highlight is that, you know, political parties are not the enemy. Right. Political parties are uh, an institution that um, was created by activists and by political uh, politicians and by voters to try to do a better job of influencing politics. Um, and so that, first of all, that just means that when you go to make your voting decision, you shouldn't be you know, afraid to support a party just because you don't agree with everything that's in the party. That like by definition, what a party is, is a group of people who might disagree, but decide to set aside some of those disagreements to advance their common goals. Um, but also that parties are a place where you can participate and get involved much earlier in the process and in so many different other ways, right? It's very hard to like you know, walk down to Congress and knock on the door and say, I want to like, I want to help out. You can get internships, of course, many of our students do, but um, you know, you have to work through that. But parties are always looking for people. Uh, local parties need people to make, uh, to do volunteering and, and the like. And if you get in and do that um, and you show, uh, you know, promise and show enthusiasm, um, that can be a gateway into doing yet even more. Um, and so I would I would 
look at political parties as a, as a great place to, um, to do participation and to really to do democracy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hans. John? So I have two suggestions. Uh, one is um, when you participate, have a particular policy goal in mind. One thing you will talk to if you have, uh, you know, if you talk to professional community organizers as well as grassroots activists, the most effective ones, right? They always think about, you know, how will what I'm doing achieve, elect a candidate or achieve a particular policy goal? And what's, and what, then there's a path between here and there. Right. <laughs> I encourage people, you know, when you are protesting or whether whether you're helping a cause, you know, make sure and it often is the case, but make sure, you know, is this not just something that's going to help me feel good, which is not a problem, but also what is the concrete goal uh, and how am I going to achieve it and how is this going to help and change policy. Right. The other thing is when you do participate, um, when you do participate, um, try when possible to advocate for changing the political rules to make it easier for others to participate, <laughs> right? It is hard to turn out in midterm elections. It is hard to turn out in local elections. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. And Jamil. Um, so I would echo the thoughts of, of Hans and John, right? That um, be it getting involved at the local level with parties and with local community organizations is certainly really important to do. Um, many of the women that I've talked to, particularly women of color who um, gone on to run for office started at the local level, getting um, into position to participate um, and sometimes with parties, sometimes not. And that was the gateway for them to be asked to run or uh, to even think about the idea of running. Uh, and so I think um, maybe you've never thought about running for office, right? Um, and most women don't, uh, but um, being in positions where you do participate might put you in a position that you may be asked uh, to serve in a different way. Um, and I like the point that John made here about uh, participating with a goal. Um, we're, we're definitely in a time where, um, a fraught moment, I would say, where emotions are really high and, um, there is a lot of, um, I would say, dissension around um, the direction um, in which policing is going in this country, and so many are taken into the streets uh, with pro in, uh, taken to the streets in protest. And we've seen some of those be peaceful protests, and others have become uh, have taken on a different look. I'll say, and so I think going to protest with a goal in mind, I think is is really important in these times, particularly. Um, for for safety, but also um, to you know really respect the work of activists who are on the ground and really um, being conscious and working uh, with these issues. Um, we're at a time where you know I, I think we don't always talk about the history of uh, social movements, particularly the civil rights movement, um, and how much uh, work and strat strategic thinking went into protests. And so I think that we can often think about these types of things that, that were done, right? These protests in the street as being, you know, almost spontaneous and they weren't, right? So moving with a goal in mind and, and engaging in, in activities with a goal in mind is important um, for not just for a strategic outcome, but also for perceptions of um, how, perceptions of protest and um, how others might perceive uh, what the movement is trying to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jamil, Hans, Jonathan, thank you for taking the time to talk with us today on such an important set of topics ahead of such an important day for our nation. And I appreciate the expertise and experience you each bring to our academic community. And I'm so glad we had this chance to have this conversation. I look forward to being with all of you again soon. Take care of yourselves and take care of everyone around you for every Hoya everywhere.